I usually get a handful of folks that ask me about uh, handling the uh, the used oil material. I was getting ready to put all this stuff up in the uh, storage garage here, and I thought I would go ahead and just show you what what I do, some of the things that help me, maybe some tips for yourself. So, I've got containers that I put used oil in, and you see that I mark them. It's very important that you mark these so that you don't forget, because it's really easy to dump this stuff into a container, put it away, you know, and a few months later, a year down the road, you don't remember what you put in there. So always mark your container. So this is the used oil out of the lathe. There was some other stuff that was in there as well. And so what I do, typically you can take this stuff. Uh, I used to be able to take this to an auto parts store and they had a container there that you can dump it in. I'm sure many of them still do that. So if you've got used oil, just check locally to see if any of your uh, parts houses uh, might let you dump oil in there. And it's usually free of cost. But in my case, what I typically do I save this stuff up and then whenever I make a run to the county landfill here in Escambia County, they have a um, they have a spot out there at the landfill where you can bring hazmat material. So used oils, gasoline, paints, chemicals, light bulbs, uh, electronics, tires, all that kind of stuff. They have a spot specifically made for hazmat. So they have a big drum out there, a big tank that you can dump your uh, used oil in and then they have a place that you can uh, put containers of old gasoline paint thinners anything like that so they manage the uh, the used hazmat out there at the county landfill so that's what I do this here I wanted to show this this is the kerosene that I use to clean the lathe out with there's really nothing wrong with it other than it's kind of got a little bit of the uh, the oil mixed in with it you know and, and some contaminants from the from the uh, gearbox but this is perfectly good to reuse to clean some machines so that's why i dumped it all in a container and we'll reuse that whenever we go to clean clean the lathe off or clean any machine if you want to do any kind of industrial cleaning kerosene works great for that and that's how uh, monarch recommends that's what monarch recommended to clean the machine there's a lot of things you can use but uh, the great thing about using kerosene it's petroleum based and not not uh, water based so you don't have to worry about any kind of water getting on your machine when you clean it if that if that's a concern to you all right i like using these guys right here although this is really the only one that i've got these uh, just right safety cans so this is my fast evaporating solvent degreaser and i put it in this right here and this this is what allows me to uh, hold this in the, you know, keep this in the shop. And when I wanna fill my small containers, my sure shots, this is what I pour into those sure shots right there. So I just keep, you know, a gallon at a time. This usually lasts for months. And then the, the big jug, I keep out here in the storage shed. All right, and then what I did with the kerosene, same thing. It's a lot easier to pour a small amount out of a small jug that you can handle versus a big, five gallon pail like that so this is just for the bulk and then this is for uh you know handling small amounts so i want to pick me up another one of these cans right here to uh, keep the kerosene in all right and then i also keep a bucket with all of the funnels you know this was the thing that i used uh, the turkey baster to suck the oil out so i'm going to keep it with all this stuff now i've got you know different funnels i wash them out whenever i'm done i got a small bucket there that i use to uh, dump the oil so i just keep all this stuff together contained i've got a lid that i can snap on that to keep the dirt and dust out of it and i just keep it stored with all of the used oil and all of the you know chemicals there oh the other thing i was going to mention see i use this stuff here this is this is just a brand name is pig you know, so I call it pig mat, but it's oil absorbent mat. The other thing that people might question is, well, what are you doing with this? You know, you can't throw that away. So I've gotten the information a while back directly off the Escambia County website that manages this kind of stuff. And when you have small amounts of oil cleanup with things like this or oil dry, you can put small amounts in your uh, trash can to be picked up by the, uh, you know, the, the uh, waste pickup. And the best thing to do is if, if you've got these or you've got rags or oil dry, anything like that, um, put it in a trash bag and tie it up and then set it in your uh, container and then you can pick it up. So this is okay to do that uh, for, for our area. I, that, may, that may not be for everybody. I'm just letting you know in Escambia County we can do that, small amounts like that. 
all right if you've got a lot of bulk then you know put it in a container and dispose of it like you should so thought i would point all that out before i put all this stuff away i'll uh i'll show you in the garage here what i do is i've got a pallet here that i keep all of my oils and chemicals on i've got some cleaners in there you know some other different types of fluid this is the uh, quenching oil i got a drum that i haven't set up yet for quenching i was going to do that next time i have to do some heat treating all right i've got this is a little bit more of the maropa 100 that we used this was for the uh, shaper all right and then this is my uh, sp300 rust inhibitor right there and i've got my uh that's the uh, soluble oil back there all right just so i keep it all contained right here together in the garage so i'm getting the gne set up the way that i want to attempt to do this job we are going to be running the 8 inch tmx milling vise on that and the reason why i wanted to use this vise is that it takes up less room than the big shaper vise and i want to be able to utilize this part of the table for uh, jack and hold down and that kind of stuff that's that's what i want to do and uh, while, I, while i'm talking about this i wanted to show you i had bought one of these um, adjustable hydraulic carts from harbor freight got it on sale you know used a coupon and this is exactly why i wanted it right here for doing stuff like this for moving these big vices around this thing worked perfect i was able to line it right up here with the table and uh, loosen the, the vice up and slide it right on off on that on that table and then now i can i'll roll it off over there out of the way and then when i'm ready to use it i can slide it right back on to the table makes that job a little bit easier so just thought i'd point that out just a little investment tool to use around here for moving heavy heavy parts all right guys we got our next project that we're going to start on this is a this is parts out of a rack and pinion steering system and belongs to uh, viewer Joseph that sent this in. And when he originally emailed me and showed me some pictures of this, what he was asking about, it was, could I spray weld this? Whenever I saw the photos through the email, I saw this right here, and I did not realize in the pictures that it was complete 180 from the gear teeth that's machined in this, this uh, rod here. So your, your rack. All right, so this is not a candidate for your normal you know spray welding like you've seen me do right there with it being on the other side of the gear teeth you're just you're just asking for a mess to uh, do something like that but what has happened uh, this is you know he's obviously wanting to repair this you've got this piece here that just backs up this rack and so the rack I'm sure the rod just slides back and forth on that so you've got some light galling right here which is why he wanted to see if it could be spray welded. So what we're going to do is we're going to machine two of these because he's actually got two of these units that he's rebuilding. We're going to machine two of these. And uh, this rod right here, I am just going to simply set it up in the lathe and just give this a light polish to knock down any of the high spots from that galling there. It does have a very, very slight bend to it. I did check it before. So when you chuck it out here in this area, this ends wobbling just slightly. I imagine that's from the machining of the rack plus the heat treating that they've done on the gear teeth there. All right. And uh, he had confirmed with the manufacturer that that's uh, normal how these things operate. And with it just being a linear motion there, I don't think that that slight amount of bend is really affecting the, uh, the functionality of it. All right, so he had purchased this piece of bronze here. This is graphite impregnated bronze, and he sent it along with it. So we'll use this to machine the two parts right there that we need. And this is a 22 millimeter rod. So we've got to, you know, we've got to cut this radius in there to fit 22 millimeter. And I don't have a 22 millimeter end mill. What I'm going to use is my little $4 flea market 13 sixteenths end mill and we'll set the the piece up and we'll come in here and we'll cut most of it out with the 13 sixteenths and I'm going to have a I'm going to preset my boring head to 22 millimeters so once we cut it with the end mill we can take the end mill out put our boring head in there and go ahead and cut that to the final radius needed to fit the 22 millimeter rod the back side there it's got a flat bottom and I didn't confirm but I'm sure that it needs to you know fit on something maybe there's another rod or something that it fits on and this is 24 millimeter so we'll just set that up 
and I'll uh, we'll bore that to 24 millimeter. Probably use a 13, 16, 10 mil to kind of create a flat bottom, and then go in there and clean it out with the with the boring bar. So that's the uh, project at hand, and let's go ahead and we'll get started on it. All right. This is just a sample piece we used to tap some holes, and I uh, drilled a hole here, and we're going to use this boring head to get it. Uh, set on exactly 22 millimeter. That's doing a pretty good job there. Use my telescope gauge to uh, get a reading on our diameter here. Probably just get it in a couple of cuts. Looks like we've got about 20 thousandths to come out of it. I've got two of my gauge pins here. This is a uh, 0.865 and then this one is 0.866. And we've got our 0.865 fitting the hole nicely. The 0.866, I would have to force it in the hole, so it's between that 865 and 866. But I mic'd the rod, and I haven't polished the rod yet either. I mic'd the rod being 865, so I think I'm gonna leave the uh, the bar setting right there where it's at at uh, at this 865 plus. I'm gonna go ahead and get this rod polished. Shouldn't take much to get this done here. This is where it ends, right there. And you can see that little bit of run out that I'm talking about. I'm gonna use some 320. Definitely see the gall there now, but we're slicking those high spots down. I'm gonna do that just a little bit more and then we'll let it go. All right, that's feeling pretty nice for what we're gonna get out of it. All right, I think how I'll work this piece, we gotta do two of them there. This is all we got to work with. I'm gonna go ahead and face the end here. We'll just get a clean face. We don't have to clean all that hole up there. And then we're gonna, we'll go to the mill and go ahead and get our radius machined in there. Once we get our radius machined in there, I'll come back to the six jaw here and we'll finish the OD of it and then part it off. That way all we gotta do is just Chuck it back up, you know, flip it around, chuck it up, and we can finish out this side right there, and then it'll be done. And then the six jaw chuck will help provide a good holding power without messing up the OD. I wanted to hold this in a collet, but my uh, hard inch collets, I don't, the closest one I have was uh, one and three sixteenths, and it won't hold that. It won't tighten down on it. So we'll just use our six jaw here. get a measurement on the depth of this radius cut in there. We'll just simply use a couple of scales. I've got my metric scale right here that um, what we can do put this one right against the very bottom there and looks like it's going to be eight millimeters deep. 
You see that? Probably a little hard for you to see, but right there in the center of the radius, and it's lined up on the eight millimeter mark there. So once we touch off there, we'll just go in eight millimeter. I went ahead and faced both ends of it, so we'll get one side cut, and then I'll flip it around, and we'll repeat it on the other side there. It doesn't really need. I'm going to hang it out, but it doesn't need to be sticking out that far. We'll just go right about there. It looks pretty good. And I'll uh, we'll just find the center using my half inch edge finder, and then we'll start our cutting. Go ahead and get our uh, touch off on the side there. I'm just going to use this piece of paper. I get the spindle lock there. I'll just pull it right on out of my fingers. I'm not holding it very tight. There we go. Should be right on the edge. About 2,000, so I zeroed the DRO and I moved over 2,000, so we should be right on the edge. Let's move it over 1,000 and see if we're cutting. Yep, touching it there. All right. Now, I seriously doubt that this mill will handle just plunge cutting the full width all the way up in there. You could take it in steps, you know, if you wanted to. I think this, the approach that I would like to do is since we're on the edge right there let's just go ahead and uh, I'm going to switch this over to metric let's go, go half of it let's go uh, four millimeters all right and then we'll um, we'll just use the quill and let it power feed down how about that hopefully that'll work let's give it a shot pretty slick so we'll probably just finish it out let's go uh, instead of going to full eight let's go over to six millimeter we'll split it in half again there so we'll go over two millimeter and see what it looks like here playing with the quill lock up here All right, one more time to finish it out. That worked out pretty good. So we'll go ahead and swap the end mill out for the boring head. I wanted to point out, I didn't go to full eight millimeter depth there because I want to be able to clean that up. I went to uh, uh, 7.9 millimeter. So we've got a tenth of a millimeter there to clean the bottom of the radius up. All right, we got our boring head in there now. And I did my calculation. I'm approximately 10 thousandths uh, from where the, the end of the uh, cut needs to be there for our eight millimeter depth. So we're, we're out a little bit. That'll go ahead and clean up this outside. Let's do that cut and see what it's, how it's going to react to it. I'm using the slowest feed rate of the mill. It's uh, almost two thousandths per revolution there. All right, it looks like that's going to do good. Actually, I think I messed up. I may not have a bar long enough to go all the way down through the, the length of that. That's something that I probably overlooked when I set that bar in there. I was, uh, I was using this length here and not the length or the diameter of the brass there. I'm just going to eyeball it from up here and see what's going on. Look at that. I had just enough to get down there. I mean just enough. 
I thought for sure it was going to start hitting it. Feed it over the, the proper amount that we can get that whole radius cleaned up there. All right, here we go. I guess it would help if I engaged the feed. There we go. All right, good. That's cleaning up the bottom there, our last tenth of a millimeter. Get to the bottom here, I'll just turn the mill off. looks good it's a nice finish too yeah we should be good to go I'll test it against the rod there but we just need to take it out and flip it around and do the other side now there's our machined radius all right looks like it's fitting the it's fitting the bar good it's just how it'll work it'll slide across there like that Right. So, one more side to do. We'll get that one milled just like we did this, and then we'll go to the lathe and get them turned and parted off after that. There's our bronze milled on both sides there. Now when you can see, I rubbed it a little bit heavier. You can see the contact down there in the radius. Looks good. All right, so our part is gonna be 30 millimeter long total. Just scaling it there, 30 millimeter. We'll just stick it out. Let's just say 40 millimeters. That'll give us 10 there for clearance. Get our, I think I'm gonna go a little more than that. Make sure that I get it turned back enough and then we got room for our parting tool to get in here. Double check the length here. I've got it set at 31 millimeters. The uh, the part will finish at 30 millimeters, so we'll face that back end off. And I'm gonna try to catch it here with this tray. And I got it pushed up in there as close as I can without hitting the chuck. This is a magnetic base, so it shouldn't go anywhere. And uh, hopefully we'll just 
catch our part right down in here, right in the bottom of that tray there. Before I get too far, I'm going to take my file and break that corner off right there. Just like I wanted there. It landed in the tray. Didn't mess it all up. got both of our pieces parted off there and I went ahead and put them back in there and chamfered the corner that was one off that I had uh, missed there so I want to end up facing these to 30 millimeter so that one looks like we've got so 20 38 so about 37 thousandths face off that side which is very close to a one millimeter 34, so about 33 thousandths on that one right there. Let's see what kind of results I can get. That's a 7 8 diameter end mill, two flute end mill. Let's see if we can plunge it with the uh, quill here. I'm just getting my touch off. We're going three quarters of an inch deep. I've got the quill uh, lightly locked so that it's not loose and uh, not just pull up in there. It's better that you do this on any kind of bronze material without a pilot hole because if you've got a pilot hole, it'll tend to try to pull it in there really hard. One, two, I mean, you go two and a half lines here. I'm just reading the quill. Right about there. better look up inside the hole there so the the ml did have a radius in the corners but that was one of the best little shorties that i could uh, find to go in a drill chuck there so i'll set up a uh, small boring bar to where we can go in there and then clean out the uh the bottom so we can we can face it all the way to the depth that it needs to be at
using the bar here to just kind of plunge the face of it down in there. That's that uh, solid rock machine boring bar. Alright, there's our full depth. Let's reset the zero there. Face it back out. We just got to finish out our, uh, our actual bore size there. So we got to take a little bit out of there. Just about done. I just need to mic it. We'll mic the bore and we'll get it right on size. It's uh, forgot what it was 24 I think so yeah 24 24 millimeters is, they got it just about right on it there Swapped out to the uh, small little 3/8 shank micro quick uh, carbide bar, just so I could get in there and uh, get the very center of it. There was a little nipple there in the center of it that I couldn't get with that half inch bar, and this one gave me just enough room to do that. So I just just finished that out, and I've already got the chamfer on there. So this one here is actually finished up. All I got left to do is uh, we need to deburr the sharp edge right around here where we did our turning and it rolled it over into the radius there. But other than that, this guy's finished up. So I'm going to go ahead and repeat that on this other one and uh, get the bore done and it will be finished. There's both of our pieces finished up. All I got left to do is I'm going to scrape this corner off there, that sharp edge where it got rolled over from the turning. I'm going to use this little Noga scraper right here to do that. And just kind of very gently scrape it by hand. Just use like a sort of like a negative rake on the tool angle there to kind of Scratch that off there. And I'll take a little tiny piece of emery and come in here with my finger and just kind of rub that and get rid of those the little scratchiness feel of the uh, deburring tool there. Bronze is a little tricky to deburr. It's so grabby. Got a little piece of emery right there. I'll take that and I'll just polish those corners off. Just like that. Just kind of soften them up. Of course, you could use a little Dremel tool or something like that to do the same thing if you wanted. I just don't feel like messing with all that. Just do it by hand. That one's done. Okay, well, our repair and our machining for the uh, rack and pinion parts here are now completed. So this one's polished up and we've got our new 
pieces that slide across the back there. Everything is on size. There's that one, and then we got this one there as well. Okay, so this uh, this belongs to Rick. So these are ready to go. I'll package this stuff back up, and we'll get it back out there to Rick so he can start his. Uh, his repair on his rack and pinion. All right, hope you guys enjoyed watching this. And we'll see you on the next project. Go in for the flip. There we go. Right. Let's go this one here. Look at that. Beautifully done. I try. <laughs> I'm just I'm just learning.